So I want to um, review some of the things that we talked about last time, because they'll be important for our understanding of the, the issues we're going to deal with uh, now and, and add a little new uh, material. So what we saw in the conversion ritual, conversion ceremony that goes back to the second century of the common era is that there are uh, a number of elements involved in it. One is essentially joining the Jewish people because you're asked a set of questions about, you know, why do you want to join? Don't you see that the Jewish people is persecuted and, and downtrodden in this period? Uh, so the one question is, do you want to cast your lot with the Jewish people. The other question involved acceptance of the mitzvot, acceptance of the commandments. Uh, what was missing, as uh, we noted, was anything about believing in God or anything else. Um, maybe it was assumed. Uh, a thousand years later, Maimonides uh, added it in, in his summary of the laws of uh, conversion. Um, and there are two models, I would say, for conversion in uh, Talmudic literature. One, which we discussed, is uh, the receiving of the Torah at Mount uh, Sinai. The other, which we didn't discuss, but we, we, we talked about um, a little, is the Book of Ruth. Now, historically, as I mentioned last time, there's no conversion in the time of Ruth, but the rabbis read conversion uh, retrospectively back into the book of Ruth. So uh, Ruth says, uh, your people shall be my people and your God, my God. And where you go, I will go, etc." But it's the first two parts of her statement to her mother-in-law on Naomi that are important to us, that your people shall be my people and uh, your God, my God. So I wanna uh, read something, uh, an English translation from a contemporary Israeli uh, modern Orthodox uh, rabbi about what, what is conversion all about? Um, and the question is, uh, is it, is one more important than the other? Is peoplehood, or is it about God and the mitzvot, or can you not separate them? So uh, his name is uh, Rabbi uh, Yaakov Medan. Uh, unlike a lot of the rabbis we're gonna talk about, he's not a dead rabbi, he's very much um, alive, and is uh, one of the heads of one of the major uh, modern Orthodox uh, yeshivot in Israel. So uh, let me read what he says in translation. It appears from the words of Ruth that the order is precisely this. Your people are my people and your God is my God. Meaning she, Ruth, accepts God's divinity by virtue of joining the people. This is also the case apparently from the section of the Talmud which deals with the essence of conversion. The, um, the text that we studied last time. From that text, it seems that conversion is identification with and taking on the yoke of the Jewish people with all its troubles. The legal necessity of converting before a Beit Din, before a religious court of three, can be explained principally as the requirement of representation from the Jewish community to receive the convert into the Jewish community meaning that the conversion involves joining the Jewish community. So the purpose of the Beit Din, of the religious court, is not just to make sure that everything is correct legally and ritually, but it's also to represent the Jewish people and to represent the acceptance of a convert by the Jewish community. The acceptance of the Torah and commandments is not an independent principle, but stems from joining the Jewish people. On the surface, it appears that the convert does not have to accept this expressly, but is sufficient if he knows 
that this is the meaning of his joining the Jewish people. Perhaps conversion occurs even as he does not know this detail. So what, what I get out of this is that you can't separate out the, uh, uh, the idea of joining the Jewish people and joining the principles of Judaism, including acceptance of the commandments. They're, they're together and inextricably uh, linked. And even if the convert is not aware uh, of what's going on, that, that both things are involved, um, after the fact, uh, they're accepted into the, the Jewish people. So peoplehood and religion in the conversion process, according to him, are inseparable. And I think this is very important. Uh, they are equally important. And uh, this is not just an abstract principle, but we're going to see how this uh, comes um, into play in modern times. But first, we're going to go to um, the text from earlier, mainly from the Talmud, uh, that rabbis draw on in considering accepting converts in the modern period. In the, in the modern period, um, already in America, in the 1700s, there's a case right here in my city of Philadelphia, where uh, a non-Jewish man, uh, excuse me, a Jewish man married a non-Jewish woman in one of the oldest congregations in Philadelphia, which still exists today, uh, founded uh, before America was founded in the 1700s, Mikveh Israel. Um, and he married civilly a non-Jewish uh, woman. Um, there were no rabbis, virtually no rabbis in America in the colonial period. Um, and the, the chazan, the, the cantor of the congregation, who was one of the leaders, but not a rabbi, took this woman and uh, converted her um, quickly and then married them according to Jewish law. So this, this problem already arises late in the 18th century and already in, the, uh, in Europe in the 1800s, um, as the walls of the ghetto come down, at least in, in Western, in, in, in Central Europe, um, Jews start marrying non-Jews. They start having children. And the question becomes, do you convert or can you convert the children and the non-Jewish wives. And we'll see why this is uh, problematic in um, a minute. So uh, if, uh, Dominica, if you could put up the first uh, set of texts that are labeled ulterior motives and conversion. Okay, so here, um, Oh, good. We have the Hebrew and the, the English. Okay. Um, so the, uh, the first uh, source um, is from the Talmud. Um, I don't think I, I mentioned in the past because we didn't have uh, these sources. There, there were two Talmuds, one from Babylonia, uh, which is Became the more, which is became the more authoritative Talmud uh, because it was where the center of Jewish life was when it was edited around the year the 600, uh, 700. And it's much more voluminous, much more extensive. And then there's another Talmud that's called the Talmud of the Land of Israel, or sometimes it's called the Talmud Yerushalmi, the Jerusalem Talmud. Um, so our first uh, text is uh, from there, and you have the Polish and uh, the English. Um, someone who converts for the sake of love, whether it be for a man, for a woman, or woman for a man, and likewise someone who converts for the sake of the table of kings, let's say for political reasons, or to get ahead economically. 
And someone who converts out of fear of lions. What in the word does that refer to? So uh, a, a little historical explanation is uh, necessary. So when the Assyrians came and destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel um, in 722 before the Common Era, they exiled most of the 10 tribes who became known as the 10 lost tribes. And they brought in um, people from their empire who they thought would be more loyal to them, all right? This happened uh, not just in ancient times, it happened in modern times. Uh, as you may know, the Russians uh, during uh, World War II kicked, uh, expelled thousands of Tatars uh, from, uh, uh, from Russia into Siberia and brought in Russian ethnics because they were worried as the German army was advance, advancing that this people would be not loyal to them. So they brought in a people from their empires, different peoples. And these people um, became known as Samaritans. And they still exist today. Um, uh, they have, they, they practice a form of Judaism that's not recognized by mainstream Judaism. They still offer animal sacrifices on Passover. They only have the five books of the Torah and the book of Joshua. They don't have uh, the entire Bible and they certainly don't have rabbinic literature. Anyways, these people were uh, assaulted by lions, according to the book of Kings in the Bible, because they didn't believe in the God of Israel. Um, and then out of fear of the lions, they start worshiping God, although they worship their own idols as well. So th that's a long story of the people who converted out of fear. And then people who converted in the time of Mordecai and Esther. Um, I refer to this phrase um, in my first talk. There is, uh, after the Jews are victorious in the Purim story, it talks about people in the capital city of Shushan. The Hebrew is mit yahadim, which probably means pretending to be Jewish because they wanted to be on the winning side. Uh, but the rabbis, again, reading conversion back into biblical times say, oh, that means they converted to Judaism. All of these are examples of converting not for reasons of faith, but for ulterior motives, political, economic, fear, or most relevant to us is going to be converting out of love of a Jewish person, all right? According to the Talmud, if you know that that's the motive of these people, if you know this ahead of time, you don't accept them. All right, differing point of view in the next paragraph. A rabbi named Rav said, the law is they are converts. And they, the rabbis, the sages do not push them away as they push away potential converts at first, but they accept them. Now, what he means is debated by later commentaries. Does he mean that they're accepted after the fact? Meaning, if you discover that somebody converted for an ulterior motive, but you don't discover this initially, but you discover it after the fact, when they're already converted, it's a done deal, right? They don't lose um, their status as Jews. Um, we're gonna revisit this issue uh, next week when we talk about whether you can lose your status as a Jew. Is there anything you can do that will cause you not to be considered a, a Jew anymore? Um, so is that what he means? Or um, some interpret this on the basis of the next text that if 
they want to come back to Judaism um, and have a second conversion uh, because they're no longer converting for an ulterior motive, but now they're converting for reasons of faith. We don't push them away. We accept them for um, a second uh, conversion. Um, and then he says they need a welcome reception for perhaps they converted for the name, meaning for God's sake. Again, the question is, how do you interpret this? And then uh, source number two. If someone converted, uh, also from the Talmud Yerushalmi, if someone converted not for the sake of half heaven and afterwards would convert again for the sake of heaven, is it possible that they would not accept them? And the answer is, of course not. We would accept them, all right, if they had undergo a second conversion. All right, let me, let me, before we go on to our next source, let me, let me pause um, and see if there are any questions. Okay, um, so let's let's go on. So, uh, source number three. Thank you. So this is from the Shulchan Aruch. The Shulchan Aruch is a law code. It's a digest of the laws in the Talmud, without all the um, discussion and argument back and forth. It summarizes what the law is. It was written in the 16th century uh, by a rabbi named Joseph Cairo. And for Orthodox Jews, and to a certain extent for conservative Jews, it's still the authoritative code of Jewish law. All right, so he summarizes some of the sources we've already seen. So I'm gonna go through this rather quickly. When a potential convert comes to convert, they inquire to determine whether he is converting to obtain money, a position of authority, or because of fear. If it is a man, they inquire if it is because he's interested in a Jewish woman, or if a woman, if she is interested in a Jewish man. In other words, you're supposed to find out the motives of the person, why they are converting. Um, if it is determined that they do not have an ulterior motive, right, then you accept them. But if they have an ulterior motive based on the sections of the Talmud we've seen before, they are um, rejected. Um, they inform them, and then this is from the Talmud that we we saw last week. They inform them of the burden of the yoke of the Torah, and the effort it takes to perform the mitzvot in order that they leave. If they accept and do not leave, we see they have come out of love, we accept them, all right? Now, you're supposed to interrogate them ahead of time and see what their motives are. But what if the rabbis don't do that? If they did not inquire about their motives or they do not inform them, about the reward and punishment for the mitzvot. But then this assumes a male convert, but this would go for a female convert also, obviously doesn't undergo circumcision. But if he was circumcised and immersed in the mikvah before three judges, he is a convert. It's a, again, it's a done deal. Even if it becomes known that he is converted for an ulterior motive or reason, since he was circumcised and immersed, he no longer has the status of an idolater, a non-Jew. So according to this view, after the fact, if you find out that the person converted from an ulterior motive, once they have converted, you cannot reverse the process. All right? Uh, next week, we're gonna discuss if there is a similarity between this Jewish position and the position of the Catholic Church. In the Catholic Church, right, baptism is a sacrament you cannot undo. 
cannot undo baptism. Once somebody is baptized, you can't undo it. Does, we're gonna, we're gonna raise the question, here it's raised and we'll raise it next week. Can you undo Jewishness? According to this, you can't. Even if you discover that the person did it for an ulterior motive, all right? However, they treat him with suspicion until his righteousness becomes clear. Even if he backslides and worship idols, or, you know, let's say, starts going to church or to a mosque, he is considered, still considered an apostate Jew. The Hebrew is Yisrael Mumar, whose kiddushin, whose wedding, marriage, are valid. Meaning, if this person converted to Judaism and then went back to Christianity or Islam, and in the meantime, during this period of backsliding, um, married a Jew, that marriage is valid as if he is a Jew. Now, this person would have certain disabilities. For example, the person would not be counted for union, all right? Would not be allowed to lead services. This is the, the convert who is converted and then is discovered not to really be practicing Judaism. Um, all right, questions. This section also will become important in modern times. All right, if I get a quiz, you'll get, give a quiz, you'll get all the answers, right? So. Nina, go ahead, Nina. Czy mogę? Bo ja mam taką wątpliwość. Jeżeli konwersja jest nieodwracalna, a chwilę wcześniej mówiliśmy o tym, że można przyjąć ponownie konwertytę, który za pierwszym razem przeszedł konwersję z powodów związanych z miłością i tak dalej, natomiast za drugim razem uznał, że jednak dla niego wartością jest sama wiara i chce tę konwersję powtórzyć. I tutaj nie rozumie tego momentu powtórnej konwersji, jako że ta pierwsza jest nieodwracalna. Okay. Um, Mara, can you translate for me, please? I, mean, I, I can translate as well. So, so Nina said that she doesn't understand uh, how come that uh, the conversion is irre irreversible if we take into account the uh, quotations that we you know, that we were talking about before. So, for instance, the one where we talked that there is a convert who converted for the reasons of love, for instance, uh, but not for the reasons of faith. And then this person comes again and, and can be converted um, again. So how would we interpret the, the fact that the conversion is irreversible according to the last uh, text that we were, uh, that we were so, talking about? So there is, uh, I'm going to uh, use uh, two terms from uh, law, Latin terms, and I'll, I'll try and translate them into English. In the law, in Jewish law, and this is true in secular law, there's a difference if somebody does something what's called ab initio, in Hebrew, lekatchila, to begin with. So if you know ahead of time that the person is converting for an ulterior motive, money, marriage, whatever, you can't accept them. But after the fact, right? Um, in Hebrew, this is called bidiyavad. They convert. You, you didn't know anything about their ulterior motives. After the fact, they convert. According to this, you have to still accept them. Right? You cannot undo the, according to this, there are people that disagree with this. You can't undo the conversion after the fact. Before the fact, you can reject them. After the fact, you cannot. Why that is, we're going to explore next week, the theology behind it. So that's coming attractions. Um, th does that help you, Nina? All right. 
Nina, did you say something? I couldn't, I couldn't hear you in Polish or English. Nina, jesteś wyciszona. How do you say on mute in Polish? I should learn that. Tak, już, przepraszam, bo coś kliknęłam, nie chcąc. Bo coś mówiłaś, prawda, Nina? To znaczy, Rabin zapytał, czy to rozwiewa moje wątpliwości. Ja odpowiedziałam, że nie do końca, ponieważ nadal nie rozumiem tego momentu, że po raz drugi ktoś przychodzi z prośbą o konwersję i wtedy się go nie odrzuca, ponieważ jego intencje się zmieniły i są związane z wiarą. Ale jeżeli się go nie odrzuca, to co z tą pierwszą konwersją? Marku, to, to było w drugim punkcie. Okej. Okay. Marku, to możesz się przełączyć na drugi kanał, bo tutaj chyba musisz na angi angielski, żeby... A, nie. Ja Marka ciągle nie słyszę. Ja przepraszam za to zamieszanie. Have we, have we lost Marek? Rabbi, so the question was, uh, yeah. if the convert comes, comes for the first time and this conversion is valid, So what is the reason behind, okay, we know the reasons because maybe it, it weren't ulterior motives, but it come in second time. So uh, how is possible when, if once the deal was done, so what about the second time? What, what is the reason behind to come in the second time? So uh, legally speaking. So the second time is to make it, so to speak, more kosher, because now we, the first time they came and they had an ulterior uh, motive. Um, but we didn't know that, right? So they're concerned about the validity of their conversion. So they come a second time, all right? Now, this doesn't happen very often. What does happen in America is people have a reform or conservative conversion, and then they become more observant and they get an orthodox conversion. That's, that's what happens in this day and age. I guess there are a couple of situations like that in Poland too, so at okay. least a lot of people know that. In America, it's fairly common that, because, you know, we have everything in America, so. All right, one, one more text. Uh, so if you could uh, scroll down, please. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So this becomes a very important text in modern times. A Gentile who comes to convert with the uh, intent to accept all the words of the Torah, except one is not accepted as a convert. So they reject One commandment. Rabbi Yossi ben Yehuda says he isn't accepted even if he rejects one detail of the words of the sages, not just one commandment, but a rabbinic, even a small detail of a rabbinic interpretation. Now, this text is never cited in all the literature on conversion from the time of the Talmud to around the year 1870 in the modern period uh, when uh, interfaith marriages come about. And this becomes a big text for the Orthodox to uh, reject uh, not only people converting for reasons of marriage, but anybody who isn't going to be Orthodox, anybody who isn't going to be 100% observant. This becomes a very big issue, as we'll see, um, in the state uh, of Israel. Um, all right, so let's, let's go back to looking at people's faces. Let's remove the text. Okay, so let me try and sum up what we've learned. Um, if you know, according to this, the text that we've studied, 
if you know the person has an ulterior motive for conversion ahead of time, money, uh, politics, marriage, right? You're not supposed to accept the person as a convert. Um, motive matters. It's supposed to be just for reasons of faith, right? After the fact, at least according to one opinion. If you only discover it after the fact and the person has gone through all the rituals and gone before the court, they're a convert. You can't undo the conversion, right? That, that's not everybody's opinion. That's one opinion. The third uh, view, that's not incorporated here that I want to mention, uh, but is kind of implied is motive is irrelevant. The person converts, that's all we need to know. We, we don't even need to ask them their motives. All right, three different uh, positions. Um, now, one thing that is not mentioned, that is mentioned in one uh, in the text that we had, that is mentioned in one of the commentaries on the Shulchan Aruch, on the law code, is what if the person is unwilling, first of all, we haven't really discussed, we did a little last time, what does it mean to accept the commandments? The orthodox interpretation today, today, in the, starting in the 18, late 1800s, is it means you have to accept everything. Meaning if there's some commandment that you're not gonna observe, some obscure law you're not gonna observe, you're out. You cannot be accepted. Um, that's not what the original text that we studied last week said. You just have to know some of the commandments. You have to know reward and punishment. It didn't say that you have to accept everything. Uh, we're going to see there are different, different interpretations. If, if the person rejects the commandments, whatever that means, according to some of the commentaries on the Shulchan uh, Aruch, um, then they're, after the fact, their conversion is not valid. I'm sorry if this is confusing, but this is Judaism. There's always a lot of different opinions on any, any issue here. All right. And all of these are going to be used in the modern period. That's why I'm mentioning them. And even under them on, among the Orthodox, we're going to see that this is disputed. All right. Any question? Questions? Or move on to the modern period. Okay, can we have the... The question was, uh, was it about uh, 613 commandments? I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. What about the 613 commandments? As I understand, uh, we're, when we're talking about accepting the mitzvot, mm -hmm. is it about 613 mitzvot, all of them, or is it something else? That's the debate. <laughs> most of the, uh, uh, um, the, most of the, the Orthodox today, starting in the 1800s, say you have to accept everything. And not only that, according to the section of the Talmud, the last text we read, um, you not only do you have to accept all the mitzvot, you have to accept all the details of rabbinic interpretations. That's one position. In the Talmud, that is not what it seems to say, at least according to my reading. It says, if you recall the passage we had last week, you, they get instructed about some of the commandments, 
some of the minor commandments and some of the major commandments. It doesn't say they have to accept everything. And that's what the debate is gonna be about. Not only between the Orthodox and conservative reform, but even among the Orthodox. All right, so in the, at the end of the 18th century and in the 1800s in Europe, Jews start marrying non-Jews. Before it was impossible, the law wouldn't permit it. But in at least, and it wouldn't be possible say, um, in Russia in the 1800s, there was no secular marriage. There was no civil marriage, right? Which would include Poland in that time. Um, but in Western Europe and in Central Europe, as the churches lose power, civil marriage is permitted. And Jews start marrying non-Jews, not in large numbers, in small numbers. So then the question arises, um, should we convert these women who are clearly, or men who are marrying uh, Jews, they're clearly converting, not for reasons of faith, but for an ulterior motive. Um, and what about the children who are born to non-Jewish women? Should we convert them? For the most part, the reform say, yes, the conservative movement doesn't exist in Europe yet. And for the most part, and we'll see there's some important exceptions, the Orthodox say no. Um, and a lot of the drama happens in Germany uh, where the reform movement starts and where more and more Jews start marrying non-Jews. Again, not like in the numbers in the 20th century, but still um, it's not such a rare phenomenon. So what we're gonna look at um, Dominica, if you could put the text up, modern responsa on conversion issues, please. Right. Um, these are, uh, this kind of literature is called responsa in, in English. These are um, essentially, do we have any uh, lawyers? Anybody a lawyer? No? Okay. Um, these are, uh, but are you a lawyer? Somebody's smiling, no, not a lawyer, okay. So these are, uh, I come from a family where everybody is a rabbi or a lawyer. So, uh, you know, my wife is a lawyer, my daughter is a lawyer, my son-in-law is a lawyer, uh, my son is a rabbi, my daughter-in-law is the only one that broke the cycle. She's a teacher. So uh, she's, she's the one with the honorable profession. So, um, so at any rate, a responsa or the singular is responsum is a legal brief. A rabbi guest asks a question, the kind of question he, has to, he or she has to look up. So he writes uh, and uh, answers the question using uh, sources. It's like writing, like a lawyer writing a legal brief for the court. That's what a response of this. So the first one we're gonna look at is uh, from, um, I'm not sure what year it's from. It's from somewhere in the middle of the 1800s from Rabbi Samson Raffel Hirsch, a German rabbi, um, arguably one of the most important German rabbis of the 1800s. He is the, um, he lives from 1808 to uh, 1888. He is the founder of what's called neo-orthodoxy or modern orthodoxy. Um, and 
Here, I think some explanation is important because this plays out in Israel. Uh, what he says is, um, you can be a modern citizen of the state, in his case, a loyal German, and still be a totally observant Jew. In other words, you can assimilate to a certain extent into German society and still be an observant Jew, unlike what the reform were saying that, no, we have to change the religion if we wanna to belong to the um, society. You can, you don't have to dress in, in distinctive Jewish clothes. You can dress like everybody else. You can get a Western education. He gets a university education. You can be part of society and enjoy Western um, culture and fit in. So this is what is called neo-orthodoxy or modern orthodoxy. And he's the founder of it uh, in Germany, Samson Raphael Hirsch. The other point of view, which is uh, called sometimes ultra-orthodoxy, I, I don't like that term. Um, I like the term they use for themselves, Haredim, those who fear God. Haredim, at least in the 1800s, and to a lesser extent in, in our 20th century and our century, say we should separate ourselves from society as much as possible. We should not get a Western education or uh, a liberal education. Uh, we should dress distinctively and live distinctly and separate ourselves out as much as possible from a Western um, secular society. So in, in Israel or America today, just to give you a sense of the difference, a modern Orthodox Jew could be found in any profession, almost, uh, would dress like everybody else, would get an education, would have a television in their house, would go to movies, um, theater, et cetera. Haredim generally don't get a college education. In America, that's less true. In America, they do. Um, don't have a television in their house, don't go to movies, et cetera. All right, so that's some of the difference between Haredim and modern orthodox. And he, Hirsch, is the founder of modern orthodoxy. So he's not, he's not at the extreme. So the question he is asked that he's responding to here is a, uh, a Jewish man married a non-Jewish woman. Should we circumcise the child? And then the idea is later the child would be converted. So this first step um, is circumcision. You don't take, um, and that of course is done when the child is eight days old. You don't take a child to the mikvah right away for safety reasons. Uh, nowadays, we usually wait until the child is several months uh, old. Why? Uh, because it's not, the child's lungs are not developed enough. And what you're going to do is put this child underwater. You let the, the, there's an adult in with the child in the mikvah. You let go of the child uh, for a second so that they're totally immersed in the water. Um, and uh, uh, that is part, that is not done though right away. That is not done until the child is older. So here also they're talking, um, they must have known that you can't take a child to the mikvah when it's newborn, it's not safe. So this is just talking about circumcision, but it's with an eye towards conversion. So what does he say? The question is, uh, so this non-Jewish woman has a child and the, the parents uh, want to uh, circumcise the boy. He says, from the perspective of the principles of the law, um, it is permitted to circumcise a child for conversion. However, there are serious considerations to not utilize this permission in our case. And what we're going to see in a lot of these cases is the rabbis don't decide purely on the basis of law. They 
are deciding on the basis of what I would call social policy considerations, the implications of the choices they're making for larger issues. The child without circumcision will remain in the mother's religions, but he will then have the possibility of living a desirable life before God by virtue of observing the seven Noahide commandments, which are incumbent on all people. So there are seven, they're called the Sheva Mitzvot B'nai Noah, the seven Noahide laws. Uh, they're in the Talmud. These are basic moral principles that everybody is supposed to adhere to, Jew and non-Jew, believing in one God, not worshiping idols, uh, not, I'm not gonna go through all seven, not, not committing adultery. Uh, interestingly, not practicing cruelly to animals. So there, there are seven laws. And according to rabbinic sources, if a non-Jew does these seven things, then they can go to heaven. So you don't need to be a Jew to go to heaven. This is very different than the traditional Christianity, Christian view. Uh, which was that if you're not a Christian, you're going to hell, all right? That's no longer the case for the Catholic churches, I hope everybody knows, since uh, the Second Vatican Council. So he's saying, look, we, we don't have to make this kid a Jew. He can live a good life and go to heaven if he's a, a, a non-Jew. But, and here I'm going to summarize somewhat, by converting this child to Judaism, we're placing him in a situation that's impossible. We're gonna make this child into a non-observant Jew because we know the parents, the mother's not Jewish. They're not gonna raise this child to be an observant Jew. What we're doing here is creating a non-observant Jew. And he can't possibly live a full Jewish life. Um, and he said, he's worried about the policy uh, consequences. What are the policy consequences? As far as he's concerned, he doesn't, it's not mentioned here explicitly. This will only encourage interfaith marriage. And of course, he doesn't uh, want to do this. Now, I want to say something about uh, converting children to explain it. Um, the child, unless they're older, obviously has no say. If you're talking about a baby or it's talking about a four-year-old or a five-year-old, right? Um, the child has no say in what's going on. Um, but you're allowed to do it, even though obviously they don't have free will because it's considered, it's considered giving the child a benefit. However, the rabbis say that the rabbis have to affirm th this conversion later in life when they become an adult, which means 12 for a girl and 13 for a boy, you know? Whether they have to actually do anything is debated in, in, in the sources. Um, so for example, if a Jewish couple um, adopts a non-Jewish child, they have to convert the child. I'm not sure if that's the position of the reform movement or not. It's certainly the position of the conservative and uh, orthodox movement. So he is against um, converting this child. Samson Raffle Hirsch. Okay, questions before we move on to the next source. Okay, so now uh, we are going to see, okay, scroll down a little more, please. Yeah, that's it, thank you. So now we're gonna see another responsum by um, another German rabbi who lives later in the 1800s named David Svi Hoffman. Uh, he actually lives into the 20th century. He lives from 1843 to 1921. 
he has a very different position than Samson Raffle Hirsch. Um, I'm not going to read through all this. I'm going to try and um, summarize it. Um, so he cites the source we've already seen that we're not supposed to, that, let me just outline the case. This is the case where a, uh, a Jewish woman um, has civilly married a non-Jewish man. Um, and she's pregnant. That's the situation. A, a Jewish woman has married a non-Jewish man and she's pregnant. And the question is, the man wants to convert. Should we accept him? It's clear he is converting for an ulterior motive, right? But he has a very different kind of perspective than Samson uh, Raffle Hirsch, all right? On the surface, he starts out saying, well, it seems like on the basis of Jewish law, we shouldn't accept this person, right? He's converting for an ulterior motive. But then he goes on and talks about some stories in uh, the Talmud. Um, one of them, well, we didn't study it, but it, it, it came two weeks ago. We studied the story of Hillel, uh, who converted the Gentile uh, while standing. The Gentile said, you teach me all of Judaism while I'm standing on one foot. Right, and he converted him on, on the spot. There's another story right in the same section of the Talmud where the Gentile sees the high priest in the temple who's got this very wonderful, beautiful uniform. And he wants to be a high priest. Now, of course, he can't become a high priest. He's not, he's not a Kohen, but he doesn't know any better. Um, he says, I want to convert so I can become the high priest. And Hillel converts him. And then he realizes he can't become a high priest. So he's converted him for an ulterior motive. There's another story in the Talmud that, again, he, he just mentions. He doesn't summarize. It's a very juicy uh, story. Uh, there are a lot of stories, by, by the way, in the Talmud. The rabbis were very earthy. A lot of stories in the Talmud involving sex. Uh, to give you a brief version of the story, this, he's not a rabbi, but this, uh, this Jew um, hears about this prostitute, that she is like the greatest prostitute ever. Um, and he goes, uh, and he goes, and he's about, he's willing to pay any price, because he's heard this prostitute is just the best ever. He's um, about to have sex with her, and he's undressing, and he's wearing his tzitzit, and the tzitzit, sort of, as he's taking them off, hit him in the face. And then he realizes, I don't know why it took him his tzitzit to realize that this was wrong, that he shouldn't be having sex with a prostitute. And he says, I can't do this. I'm sorry, I can't have sex with you. And the prostitute, this is clearly, by the way, a made up story from the rabbinic imagination says, wow, I'm so impressed with your faith that you know, you turn me down. Nobody turns me down. And she follows him back to the land of Israel and wants to convert to Judaism. And despite the fact she's converting for an ulterior motive for him, the rabbi lets her convert. So that's another story where the rabbis seem to let people convert for ulterior motives. So here's where we're going to pick this up. The, the Tosafot, the medieval commentators, solve this problem in each case. It was certain to the rabbis that in the final analysis, 
the convert desire to convert for the sake of heaven. All right? That, yes, they originally came with ulterior motives, but later their motives switched and they're doing it for pure faith reason. So Rabbi David Fried Hoffman says, all right, this woman's already married to this man civilly in the eyes of the state. If she's converting now, it really is for the sake uh, of heaven. And um, so we can convert him. It's really for the sake of heaven, ultimately. Also, she's pregnant, right? And she's continuing to live with him. It's a prohibition for her to live with him. If we convert him, we will stop her from sinning with him. Because intermarriage with a non-Jew is greater than the possible misdeed of converting somebody for ulterior uh, motives. She's not going to leave him because she's pregnant. Not only that, there's a better chance that the children are going to turn out to be Jewish if the father shares the same religion as the mother. And for all these reasons, he says the lesser of, of the two evils is to convert this man. That way, she will no longer be in a prohibited relationship. And there's a better chance the child will have a Jewish identity and, his, and the child's descendants will have a Jewish identity. Then he says at the end, if we could go to the end, please. Thank you, that's enough. At any rate, the Beit Din should admonish the Gentile to observe the entire Jewish religion, especially Shabbat and forbidden foods, but it's better to accept a promise rather than an oath from him. Meaning, okay, there's some things we really would like him to observe. Maybe he doesn't have to observe all the commandments or promise to observe all the commandments, but at least he should say that he's gonna keep Shabbat and keep kosher. And we don't have to get him to swear, but maybe it's enough if he promises that he will do this, that he will try and do this. That's enough for him. It doesn't have to be acceptance of all the commandments. Why? Why is he willing to be so lenient? For social, for individual and social policy considerations. Better that this child be raised in a family that's entirely Jewish. Okay. All right, questions. All right, let me, let me see people's faces again because we're gonna move away. So Rabbi David Sveed Hoffman, he's an important rabbi, but he's a minority position among the Orthodox in the uh, 1800s. Uh, and uh, the vast majority of uh, Orthodox are going to re reject his uh, position. Um, so let's talk now, uh, we're, we're, we'll come back to this question of converting um, non-Jews who marry Jews, but what's come to America? Uh, generally speaking, the Orthodox will not accept conservative or reform conversions, no matter what, no matter how pious the conservative rabbi is, no matter how observant the convert is, just because it's done by reform or conservative rabbis, they will not accept them. 
And most Orthodox rabbis, but there are exceptions in America, will not accept people who are converting for reasons of marriage. The most famous exception, Ivanka Trump, right? She was converted in Orthodox conversion by a modern Orthodox rabbi in New York, a very prominent uh, modern Orthodox rabbi. Um, how observant is she? I don't know, not for me to judge, but she certainly had um, an Orthodox uh, conversion uh, and they belong to an Orthodox synagogue. So, um, let's talk a little about conversion in the United States. So, um, reform Judaism in America has always been more liberal than reform Judaism in Europe and other parts of the world. So, um, originally, the reform in America did not require uh, the traditional acceptance of the commandments, whatever that means, again, which is not clear. They just said, you have to believe in God. Um, they did not require for men circumcision or for men already circumcised, um, taking the ritual pinprick, pinprick of blood out, nor did they require mikvah for men or women, immersion in a mikvah. That was the original reform uh, position. Um, nowadays, uh, the reform movement in America has become more traditional. Um, a a bait in circumcision and mikvah are not required, but many rab, reform rabbis do do them. So for example, um, something that would be hard to believe 50 years ago here in the Philadelphia area, there's a reform uh, synagogue that has a mikvah that's primarily used for conversion. Um, in Europe and Israel, uh, as I mentioned, the reform movement has been more uh, religiously observant. And as far as I know, in Europe um, and in Israel, um, any conversion requires uh, a baiting mikvah and circumcision or hatafat dambrit. All right. Um, because I, I mentioned this uh, in my first talk, be, because of the America, American reform movement, uh, accepting a child as Jewish, whether the father or mother is Jewish, if the child is raised Jewish, this has led to a big decline in conversions among reformed Jews in America, because it's not needed anymore to have your child uh, be Jewish, as long as one parent is uh, Jewish. Um, let's go to the conservative movement. Um, the conservative movement will recognize reform conversions provided, so it's okay if the rabbi is reform, provided there is mikvah and circumcision. If not, it's very problematic. And I unfortunately have had to deal with such cases. It's very hard um, speaking as a rabbi when you have somebody who's been a convert say for a long time, um, maybe they've been, you know, they converted for marriage, they've been married 20 years, their, their family joins a conservative congregation, all of a sudden you have to tell them, well, if you didn't have the mikvah, you're, you're not Jewish as far as um, we are concerned. Um, and even though it's a small, it seems to be a small thing to ask, to ask them to just to go to, to the mikvah, um, it, it's, it's, it's very upsetting to people. 
Um, so there are conservative rabbis that say, okay, you know, if they've been living their life for a Jew all these years, we're not going to require them to do anything. But that's not the majority view in the conservative movement. But again, if everything is done ritually properly, the conservative movement will accept uh, reform um, conversions. Um, the conservative movement in America accepts conversions for reasons of marriage. The idea is if the person shows by virtue of taking a class on Judaism, a sincere desire to embrace uh, Judaism, um, then that counts as accepting Judaism. And you could say, like Rabbi Hoffman, they don't quote Rabbi Hoffman, that, um, that they are actually at least in part converting for the sake of heaven, for the sake of God. As a matter of fact, you can make that uh, distinction even more as happens in my experience, what happens is uh, the, the non-Jewish partner has not converted when they got married. The non-Jewish partner, uh, if it's a woman gets pregnant and they say, you know, they, they come to the decision, it'll be better for the child if we both have the same religion. And the non-Jewish partner now comes to convert. You can really say that is for the sake of God, for the sake of heaven, they're converting really not for ulterior motives. And in my experience, that is when a lot of non-Jewish spouses convert, when they start having children. Um, and I, I wanna add one other thing from my uh, experience, and this is, I'm not a psychologist, uh, but this is just my personal experience. A, a, lot, a, a, in, a lot of people are drawn to Jews as their partners, not by accident. That they have some inkling, some interest in Judaism to begin with. And that's why they are drawn to Jews. Um, so there are about Nobody's done a survey, but about out of the 6 million American Jews, 200,000 converts to Judaism. Uh, most of them for uh, reasons of marriage and love, but not all. Um, so it's an interesting phenomena here in, in, in America. So that is, if you do the arithmetic, I think that's uh, one thirtieth. So what is that? Like 3% uh, or so of American Jews are converts. It, it's an important percentage. Um, and I, I think because America is such a, an, oh, at least it used to be an open country, there, there are a good number of uh, people also, I, I can't give you numbers or percentages, who convert for reasons of faith. Interestingly enough, um, a good number of African-Americans, including some famous people, all right? All right, who you probably wouldn't know in Poland, but they're famous in America. Um, all right, so that's sort of the, the landscape in America. And again, generally the Orthodox will not accept the reform and conservative conversions almost uniformly. Some Orthodox rabbis will accept conversions for the reasons of marriage, for reasons of marriage, but they are a minority. All right, questions about uh, America and conversion in America. No? Okay, 
just I'll tell you one quick story just to show you how widespread conversion is, uh, even though it's not the majority of cases. Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker of the House of Congress, has a Jewish son-in-law. Her daughter converted to Judaism. So it doesn't hurt. And I think uh, some of Biden's children married Jews. I'm not sure if the, any of, none of them converted though. Okay, let's go back to uh, the text. Um, all right, so then the next responsum is from an American Orthodox rabbi, very important uh, rabbi uh, in the 20th century, Rabbi Moshe Feinstein. And uh, he is asked about whether you can uh, accept a, uh, a convert who converted under conservative auspices. Right? Um, number three. So as to your honors, he's answering a question about whether this convert can be accepted. As to your honors doubt if a convert who did not accept the mitzvot can indeed be considered a convert, meaning they didn't have in his mind a proper kabbalat ol mitzvot, a proper acceptance of the commandments, it's simple and clear that he's not a convert even post facto, after the fact. For lack of acceptance of the mitzvot by a convert prevents the validity of the conversion. All right? That remember, we had different points of view on that. He takes the stricter point of view. If you find out after the conversion that the person did not accept the mitzvot, he's not talking about ulterior motive here. No acceptance of the mitzvot, it doesn't count. Even if he says that he accepts the, the commandments, if we bear witness to the fact that he is not sincere, it, his acceptance is nothing. Meaning if we see that he's not living an observant Jewish life, all right? Now, then he goes on to say, conversion for marriage is legally effective after the fact, meaning if you discover the person converted for ulterior motives after the conversion was done, but the law applies when even because of marriage, he truly accepted the commandments, meaning his interpretation of that is that if the person converted for an ulterior motive, marriage, but the person accepted the commandments, then it counts, even if he converted for an ulterior motive. But this is his interpretation. If he didn't accept the commandments, truly accept the commandments, no, it doesn't count. And I don't know the reasons why rabbis err in this, meaning there are some Orthodox rabbis, as I mentioned, minority, who, and he's, this probably was written about 1950, who are willing to accept conversion for marriage. For they believe they are bringing some benefit to the Jewish people by accepting some converts. Uh, but he says, no, it's really bad to have converts who are not sincere converts. Um, in another responsum, he is asked whether somebody who has undergone a conservative conversion can be buried in a Jewish cemetery. And he says flat out, no because it doesn't involve real acceptance of uh, the commandments. All right, questions? And then we're gonna go to Israel where we're gonna end up for our final section. Okay. So, so how is it? Uh, how is it with uh, being buried in a Jewish cemetery? Uh, 
today in the state uh, or in so, Israel? So here it's very complicated because <laughs> some of the cemeteries are part of a big business, meaning, mm. I don't know how to put this, they're chains, meaning they're companies that own Jewish cemeteries and non-Jewish cemeteries all over the country. Oh. All right. And uh, they have practice what I would call don't ask, don't tell. Meaning I have family, my, my wife's side, they were interfaith couple. They bought cemetery plots in a Jewish cemetery. Nobody asked them to prove that, you know, she was not Jewish. Nobody asked them to show that they were Jewish. They bought the cemetery plots. Um, they were buried side by side. I know this because I was there. I performed his funeral. I'm, I'm not going to uh, rat them out, you know. Uh, this is the case. Also, uh, there are reform cemeteries where they permit Jewish and non-Jewish partners to be buried together, all right? What Orthodox cemeteries do? I don't know. Do they ask people? Do they ask them to prove they're Jewish? I don't think so. Um, but most cemeteries, and then some cemeteries are private. They're owned by synagogues or nonprofits. But I don't think most of them ask anybody to prove that they're Jewish. So that, that's the world we live in today. Um, now, according to Jewish law, only Jews are supposed to be buried in a Jewish cemetery. Now, what you can do, nobody wants to do this. Um, this is what the conservative movement says you should do. Um, you could have the non-Jew buried next to the, non, to the Jew if you had some kind of division between them, a hedge or a pathway or a road or something like that. So, but who, nobody's gonna wanna do that. So that's what goes on in America today. Um, my bet in the Warsaw Jewish Cemetery, which I've been to a number of times, uh, I love going there because it's like a walk through Jewish history. Um, I bet they're much stricter. I don't know. I'm just wondering. Does anybody know? I, I don't know. I cannot tell. Okay. Do you live in Warsaw? Yeah, yeah. And I, and I know the cemeteries, but I was never interested, you know, in asking, like, what are the rules? Uh... Right. I, I don't know. I, I don't know either. But I assume it's run by the Orthodox community, so I assume maybe they ask, but I don't know that. All right. So I think that answers your question. So. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, when it comes to Israel, you're going to talk about Israel now. Anyway. Right. We'll talk about okay. Israel. Thank you. All right. Any other questions before we go on? OK, so. Um, so this is a response from the, the first Sephardic chief rabbi in Israel after the founding of the state, very important rabbi, Rabbi Ben-Zion uh, Uziel. Uh, um, uh, let me just say one more thing about the American um, Orthodox, um, about uh, acceptance of conservative conversions or reform conversions. There are only two rabbis that I know of in America, well-known rabbis who accept conservative conversions. Uh, and both of them say that, yeah, the conservative basically do acceptance of mitzvot because all uh, acceptance of mitzvot means is accepting a basic faith in God. And so long as there's circumcision and mikvah, we should accept them as converts for the sake of unity of the Jewish people. But again, they're minority voices. All right, let's go back to Israel. All right, so here, here's the case. You've got, um, 
a Gentile woman who's married a, a Jewish man. Um, and she's already had some sort of civil ceremony, not in Israel, but outside of Israel, because as you may know, there's no civil marriage in Israel, right? If you're a Christian, you have to get married in a Christian ceremony. If you're a Muslim, I'm a Muslim, Jewish, a Jewish ceremony, only by an Orthodox uh, rabbi for it to count. There's no civil marriage um, in Israel. So he says, look, basically, this is the lesser of evils, right? It's better to save one, someone. Uh, here's the example he gives from transgressing a, a capital offense with a minor sin. So if somebody removes bread from an oven on Shabbat and they're going to thereby prevent somebody from actually baking on Shabbat, that's okay. It's forbidden to remove the bread, but that's only a minor offense. Baking is a major offense. Better they should do the minor offense than the major offense. That's the analogy he uses here. This is a Gentile woman who's married to a Jewish uh, man. She wants to convert uh, because, so he says, look, if we let her marry, it's very similar in a way to uh, the David Svi Hoffman, right? Every time she has sex with him, it's a sin. Whereas uh, the conversion for the sake of marriage is only forbidden, um, ab initio, le katrila, but not post facto, it counts. So this is the lesser of two evils. This is an emergency situation. We should um, allow it. All right, but uh, this is a minority voice when it comes to uh, Orthodox rabbis um, in Israel. Um, Orthodox rabbis in Israel will not generally uh, not convert people uh, for marriage or convert the children who are of an interfaith uh, marriage. Um, uh, there are very few exceptions to that. And the Orthodox control, and we'll talk a lot more about this in a minute, the Orthodox control um, marriage and divorce in Israel, and sometimes they control who gets registered as a Jew, but not always. Um, so now, uh, let, let's remove the text. And I, I'm gonna try and do a very quick history of who is a Jew in Israel, all right? In Israel, uh, there is something that some of you may be familiar with called the law of return. In Hebrew, Chok Hashvut. It was passed in 1950. Uh, so two years after Israel became a state. And it said, basically, there's automatic citizenship for anybody who's a Jew from abroad who comes to Israel. It didn't define who is a Jew. All right. Um, in uh, 1970, the law was finally defined. Who is a Jew was anybody who had one Jewish grandparent, why did they pick that? Does anybody know? Because of the difficulty with uh, collecting documents after the war? No. Because that was the Nazi definition of who was a Jew, according to the Nuremberg laws. Um, if you have one Jewish grandparent, one person married, a person married to a Jew could come, somebody who converted to Judaism. And by the way, uh, the latest interpretation of the law, um, if a gay couple is married outside the land of Israel, uh, the gay partner is not Jewish, they can come 
uh, with the Jew if they make Aliyah. There's no gay marriage in Israel yet, but gay marriage outside of Israel is recognized in Israel, just like civil marriage outside of Israel is recognized in Israel. Um, so, uh, or somebody who converted to Judaism. All those categories are eligible under the law of return. There was a famous case that went before the Israeli Supreme Court in 1962 called the Brother Daniel case. This was a Jew whose parents gave him to a Catholic family in Poland uh, during the war. He was raised as a Catholic. He became a monk. He moved to Israel and wanted to become a citizen under the law of return. Now, anybody can become a citizen in Israel after just like in any country, you know, if you live there for a certain number of years, only Jews can become um, automatic citizens. Though. Um, so this case went before the Israeli Supreme Court. And even though technically, as we'll see next week, he was halachically a Jew, the Supreme Court ruled against him. That's the Brother Daniel case. Uh, since the law in 1970, there have been repeated efforts by the right-wing Orthodox, by the Haredim, to try and amend the law so that it reads conversion according to Orthodox standards. It's never passed. There have been repeated efforts. It hasn't happened. Um, in 1989, there was an Israeli Supreme Court decision that said that uh, uh, involved a woman named Shoshana Miller, who had a reform conversion in the United States, um, came to Israel, uh, joined the Israeli Air Force, wanted to be recognized as a citizen under the law of return. And the Supreme Court ruled in her favor. Now, this only applies to being a citizen as registered by the Interior Ministry. It doesn't help getting married. It doesn't help getting buried. Uh, well, that's a little more complicated. Marriage, as I mentioned, is controlled by uh, the Orthodox. And it's not just the Orthodox, it's the Haredim. Uh, modern Orthodox Zionist rabbis, there are, but the Haredim have more control over the official rabbinate in Israel than the Zionist modern Orthodox um, rabbis. So uh, if, for example, you, a lot of Israeli couples uh, don't want to get married by the rabbinate for a variety of reasons. They go to Europe or particularly to Cyprus where you can get a quick marriage. The marriage is recognized by the state of Israel. It's not recognized by the rabbinate. Um, now, I mentioned burial. Most of the cemeteries are controlled by the Orthodox. There are some exceptions. The kibbutzim have cemeteries that bury anybody. And uh, there are some non-sectarian cemeteries elsewhere in Israel. So this 1989 Supreme Court decision was very important, at least in terms of who is a Jew as far as the law of return is concerned. Um, just recently, in March of 2021, uh, the Supreme Court said that uh, conversions performed in Israel by reform or conservative rabbis are valid for the law of return. Meaning, if you, even if you started your conversion outside of Israel, but had finished in Israel under reform or conservative auspices, you have to be recognized as a Jew according to the law of return. It doesn't help you with marriage or other um, issues. By the way, some people I should add, get a civil marriage outside of Israel, and then 
in Israel have a conservative or reform rabbi uh, marry them because they want to have a Jewish ceremony. Um, now, this is just such a huge issue. I cannot uh, mention its importance enough. There are uh, 500,000 people in Israel who are non-Jewish by any definition, right? Maybe they had one Jewish grandparent. They came in, in the Russian Aliyah. Um, this is a ticking time bomb, I, I think, as far as Israel is concerned. Um, some of them have been soldiers who have died in battle. But fortunately, there's cemeteries they can go to, even though they're not most of the official cemeteries. The official rabbinate is supposed to convert these people, but they, they put up all kinds of roadblocks and make it very difficult. Why? Because of their understanding of Kabbalat ol mitzvot, of accepting the commandments. Because they know these people are not going to be observant. And they accept the stringent view of what that entails. So only about 2,000 people are converted um, a year. Some Orthodox Jews in Israel won't recognize Ethiopian Jews, of which there are 150,000 as Jewish. So another big problem. Um, and some of the um, Orthodox rabbis in Israel of the rabbinical courts won't recognize Orthodox conversions in the United States or Europe and won't even recognize conversions by modern Orthodox rabbis in Israel. Just one example of this, in 2008, there was a rabbi named Rabbi Sherman, he was a Haredi rabbi, who was head of the sort of Supreme Rabbinical Court, not the Supreme Court of Israel, but the Supreme Rabbinical Court. He attempted to invalidate um, thousands of conversions performed by a leading modern Orthodox rabbi named Chaim Druckmann. He said they were invalid. But this ended up in the secular courts and Rabbi Druckmann's conversions were upheld. This could have affected the lives of thousands of people. Um, I'm not going to go into any more details. There have been a lot of attempts at um, compromise within Israel over this issue, none of them have come to fruition. Um, I hold some hope out for the new government because the new minister of religion in Israel from the Yamina party is a modern Orthodox Jew. He's not a liberal. He's not gonna um, recognize conservative and reform conversions. But um, he has he wants to take away the monopoly from the chief rabbinate, which is mainly Haredi, and give it give conversions to local rabbinic courts in local cities where some of the rabbis are more liberal and more accepting and will do a better job converting the Russian Jews. There's a whole moderate modern rabbinical organization in Israel that is uh, devoted to making Judaism more approachable and making the conversion is issue more um, uh, flexible. They're, they're called Sohar. Uh, I know about them personally because we have a cousin who's a rabbi who's a, a, a member of it. So there, there's some hope with the new government, there will be some liberalization and conversion, but who knows how long this new government's gonna last. Um, I, I wouldn't put a lot of money on them lasting more than two years, even that might be a miracle. So, all right, there's much more to be said about this issue. I, I don't wanna take up any more of your time and I wanna leave a few minutes for questions particularly about the uh, Israel.
No questions? Okay, so next week, the question that we just talked about a little is, can you lose your Jewishness? Can you lose your status as a Jew? What happens to a Jew who converts to another religion? Are they still considered a Jew? And if so, for what purpose? 